hey, it's Matt here from Music Speaks, and today I'm chatting with John Gibbons, the uh, producer and uh, remixer. Hi, hi, John, how you doing? I'm really good, Matt. How are you keeping? I'm, I'm very good, very good, thank you. Um, so I gather recently you uh, you obviously released your, your single Hot Stepper, um, the cover of the, the 1994 hit. Um, how, how did you feel sort of prior to dropping the single? I'm always nervous about dropping a single, particularly when it's a cover version and even more especially when it's a track that's so loved and something that I had loved from years ago from childhood. Yeah. So I'm, I'm always very keen, obviously, to do it justice when I do something like that. And there is a bit of trepidation as to whether or not people will receive it well if they've liked the original or whatever. But thankfully, <laughs> I'm very gratified by this. People <laughs> seem to really like it. It's going down extremely well. So those nerves were kind of shed quite early on because the reaction was quite instant. So I'm very, very pleased. But to answer your question, very nervous. <laughs> I was going to say that the reception seems to have been really, really good, which is great. So, um, yeah, no, that's, it's amazing. Uh, I, I particularly love the track. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. So, But, yeah, how, how did it sort of come about? How did you kind of decide that's, that's the track I'm going to do? <laughs> um, well, it kind of happened been semi-organic i'm always playing around the studio with different samples and bits and pieces and nine times out of ten i don't do anything with them mm -hmm. but um as people who know my music will know would i lie to you and pyt had been big hits for yeah. me as straight up cover versions of old classic 90s tracks that i had kind of gr grown up listening to and they reminded me of summer and that kind of stuff and again i was playing around with hot stepper and i thought mm. you know what what better track to kind of complete that trio of big summer tracks nice. for me anyway yeah, than yeah. that and i said look i'll give it a go i'll see if i can do it any justice in my own head mm -hmm. or to my own ears and if i think i've done half a job then maybe i'll let one or two other people have a listen and get some feedback so that's exactly what it did and it all flowed really really quickly and came together quite quickly after that and i mean for example, I, I know PYT, there was maybe a year of a gap from when I produced it to when it was released. Mm -hmm. This was quite quick. I only produced it maybe a couple of months before it actually did get released. Yeah. So it was much faster than some of the other ones. But there is a common thread throughout all the music that I do. It tends to be the stuff I work hardest at mm -hmm. is the stuff that doesn't work as well. And the stuff that just seems to come from a kind of yeah, a flow state that happens quite quickly mm. tends to be best. And this was certainly one of those tracks. I just felt it from the start. Yeah. Uh, that seems to have kind of come out in the real world now yeah that's as well. always good and and yeah. and when you sort of decide to do like a, a, a cover version of a track um do you kind of yes yeah, so obviously that happened with this one but you know do you often kind of look for samples and go this is the sample i'm going to use um or do you do you kind of find that you have to get permission to use the samples first or yeah you know? well when it comes to that i mean lo luckily my label good soldier are great and they sort out that side of stuff so nice. there have been tracks in the past where i've been really really happy with the finished product and we haven't got clearance on a sample or mm. stuff that hasn't um hasn't ended up being released for one reason or another to do with clearances so it's not the case that everything we use or everything we try yeah. turns gold or even gets a release automatically I so mean, again, I'm Jackson one that's a big one <laughs> well that that was just one I never expected that was really yeah. just a bit of fun I thought maybe I'll put it out as a bootleg yeah, and yeah. the label had to listen to it and they said yeah it's great but it's a Michael Jackson sample we're probably never going to be able to do anything <laughs> yeah. with it and I forgot about it and a year later the track got released I remember getting a phone call maybe nine or ten months later mm. saying do you know what we're, we're after getting that PYT thing cleared <laughs> and all of a sudden the I dream was realized you if you like lost your, so lost your again, mind. I'm not really privy to any of what goes on I don't know no. how the clearances are done it's interlabel and interpublisher and that kind of thing but um thankfully I'm kind of left alone and I just get a yay or a nay if there's something that we really like so really there's cool. loads of stuff sitting there in the studio that may never see the light of day mm -hmm. for the reasons that you've kind of highlighted there. But yeah. every now and again, one does, and Hot Stepper is one of those, and I'm really pleased. Yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, and to be honest, I've loved, I've loved all of the covers. So yeah, no, doing, doing a good job. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, because I found out recent, I only found out recently that um, Sagala with the Easy Love that none of that is actually a sample. He re-recorded all the vocals, which I was like, blimey, that is effort. <laughs> well done. Yeah, <laughs> it's great thing, and I've I've done a lot of that with them. Um, there there have been parts of the aforementioned tracks as well. Mm -hmm. Where the very same thing has been done mm. where you can't get a clearance you can sometimes get around it by yeah, by actually yeah. having a straight up re-sing yeah. and to try and find somebody who can yeah maybe, say i mean a michael jackson or a jackson five or an indie Camosi or whatever it's it's not as easy as it might no. sound <laughs> but, um so are there any kind of covers that you've either you know not released so far in the pipeline to expect or 
kind of um there, there were one or two I, I don't know what to expect but uh there are kind of five or six there i always have one or two on standby mm-hmm. and i'm always very hesitant to say in advance because it's such a cutthroat yeah. business yeah. that somebody latches onto what might be a good idea it's kind of a free-for-all when it comes to covers because if one person can get clear and so can two so can yeah, three yeah seen a lot of tribe I've, I've actually experienced it myself with would i lie to you mm. uh david getta and cedric Gervais actually covered the track as mine was out there doing its thing so okay. i'd kind of got traction in the uk and ireland mm. and it was a hit there and all of a sudden david getta releases his version which mm. he's perfectly entitled to do you know i mean yeah. it's <laughs> end of the day it's it's not my track <laughs> that he's called it's the original so he released his and that just put the skids on my track doing any kind of business in central europe like right. straight away where i was getting traction david get obviously being a gigastar just <laughs> immediately overnight that was the version that, that that they went for so we kind of the pot was split in terms of where those tracks did well we've seen it in the past with artists like top talk and jonas blue with fast car oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's something that I, <laughs> i've been coached into being very very careful about releasing names before a track actually drops yeah, that makes sense. i will say there are there are some in the pipeline yeah and there are lots of original tracks there as well which i'm was, particularly excited about yeah so, no i was just about to say because obviously new material yeah, no, I was going to say, obviously, you've, you, you you know, as well as the covers, you've released quite, you know, a fair few original tracks as well with some, some great artists. Like, how have some of those collaborations come about? Like, Nina Nesbitt's a pretty big, pretty big one. <laughs> yeah, that was a great one. The track was already done, um, and I did kind of a sample vocal in there. Um, it was actually a sample of the original Christa Berg vocal that I'd used. Yeah. And again, it, it didn't really feel right because for, for a kind of youthful audience. Mm. And uh, so I spoke to management and the label. I said, look, is there anybody really good that we could potentially get for this? Mm. And from speaking, we kind of compiled a wish list okay. at which Nina was Nina was top of that list. Mm. I'm not a hope we're ever going to get her. <laughs> but fast forward a month later and Nina agreed to be on it. Yeah. And I mean, the track was a really big radio hit for me in the UK and Ireland. So yeah. that that was just one where it, it was almost like the stars aligned. You know, yeah, that, yeah. that wouldn't just happen. Then there have been other acts that I've worked with and again for different reasons different scheduling reasons the tracks haven't been released and mm-hmm. been replaced by another artist or haven't been replaced at all and um, so and a lot of it just happens organically a huge amount of that kind of work is artist to artist like everybody kind of assumes that oh it must be labels setting up everything in sure. the background but a huge I find the best route is the direct route for me personally so I'm always sending sure ideas out there to different singers different artists and yeah. It's just a case if somebody comes back on it, great. And if yeah. they don't, that's fine too, you know. So yeah. a lot of it, and from talking to other guys and girls who are producing, that is the way a lot of collabs come about. Yeah, Even at that A-list level, yeah. a lot of those are coming about organically. People who tour together might be on the same lineup at a gig or a festival yeah. and just, just play just with their music. And if something connects and clicks, well, boom, yeah. there's a collab. Awesome. So, no, that's really yeah, cool. It is genuinely organic. Yeah. yeah, no, that that's awesome. And is there anyone like if you could collaborate with anyone, any other singers or produ- or producers, is there anyone you've got like on top of I want that? I, think I like to dream big in terms of singers, um Why not? <laughs> the, the weekend there's oh, there's yeah, just something sick. about his voice that yeah. just does it for me and I think lends itself yeah, yeah. to music as well as pop and the more yeah. downbeat stuff. So I'd love to do something with him and Zara Larson is a singer. Oh yeah really love to work with as well there, yeah. again there's something there's just a quality to her voice and i love her attitude on stage and her stage presence as well mm. she would be amazing i think to, in, to yeah. i mean to incorporate her as part of my live show or vice versa <laughs> be be amazing. Amazing. <laughs> and, and then collab wise there are loads of producers i'd love to do something with but calvin harris yeah i mean I, I have grown as a producer from listening to Calvin Harris over the years. Yeah. And uh, I've developed my sound. And there's a simplicity to what, what he does that I think is part of the genius of it. I mean, if you really dissect his stuff, there's a lot going on. But when you uh, have a casual listen to Calvin Harris's stuff, it mm. all seems so easy and so simple and flows so well. He's not afraid to try things. And yeah. I just think I think the guy is an absolute production genius. And I would love to sit down <laughs> in a studio with him. Yeah, yeah. And not it's just funny because he skirts he around dance. But... Sorry, say again. Pardon? Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) I know I was saying he skirts around dance, but he's still like very much, you know, he's experimented with like many different things, which, you know, certainly I can hear in yourself, you you know, your your sound is not sort of like, you know, it's it's diverse. It's, It's good. Yeah. I like. <laughs> yeah, again, again. I mean, he, he is a huge, huge inspiration for me in that diversity and that adaptability. And it's almost like every time there's a musical shift, Calvin Harris is at the forefront of it. I mean, he's a trendsetter rather than a follower. Yeah, yeah. And it's something that as my career progresses, 
I want to do more and more and I want to try and push the boundaries with my sound. Mm. And I'm really pleased with the direction I'm going in that regard. Like there's a lot of stuff that I think is going to surprise some people over the next year or two years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just very excited to get it out there because it helps me grow as well. Uh, when people feed back and I see the reactions of both fans and critics and mm. the industry at large. And yeah, it's an exciting time for me. So uh, oh, if I can cool. emulate even a fraction of what Calvin Harris has done, <laughs> I'm in a good place. Awesome. And and what is your kind of usual writing and recording process like? You know, do you, how do you go about writing? It varies. I mean, sometimes the idea will come from the spark of another track. So I might mm. listen to something and think, oh, that's a sound I haven't experimented with before. Mm. And I start to experiment. And invariably, what I set out to do mm. becomes something very different by the end. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, quite often what I start, in the early days of production, what I used to do was quite literally get a track and try and replicate it. And mm-hmm. I'd never get it right. So it would become something else. Yeah. And I realized that that for me was a process in the early days that worked. So I, I kind of kept doing it. So what started off as a copy always morphed into something else. Mm. Um, I work with a lot of other producers. I'm constantly over and back to the UK now working with a lot of people over there. Um, there's a core team who I work with in Ireland as well. Um, shout to Simon Tist, my production partner in almost everything that I've done to date. I mean, we've work together from the year dot and we just have this kind of dynamic that works really really well i'll bounce all my stuff off him he'll bounce all of his stuff off me and vice versa and more often than not my tracks end up with a lot of his stuff on it his, his footprint is firmly my footprint as well and we're more than the sum of our parts so there's a huge amount of that kind of collaborative work goes on there as well That's in cool. the background as i find happens with a lot of producers so mm. it's like this giant smorgasbord of <laughs> producers everywhere I turn and that tends to be the case in dance music anyway yeah. everybody is feeding off each other and everybody's kind of helping each other while, while the music business can be cutthroat yeah, yeah. I find that amongst producers there there is there is a kind of a code and the more people you can work with the more cross-pollination there is with guys that you haven't worked with mm-hmm. in the past and again the world becomes smaller as yeah, a result. Yeah. so um, there, there isn't really, to answer your question, that was quite long-winded, but to give you a brief answer yeah, on it, cool. there isn't an actual process that I sit down and say, right, here's the way I write a track. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it starts with an idea in my head that might be vocal. Sometimes the right. idea might be musical. Sometimes I literally sit down in front of the keyboard and see what comes out. Yeah, just go, just sometimes go. nothing <laughs> comes out. And sometimes I'll find a sample that I like and base it off that yeah. or an idea that somebody sent me. So It's good to be diverse as well. It's good that you've got different ways yeah. of kind of, you know. yeah. And it's a different challenge every time, you know, yeah, yeah. so... I, I mean, it was one of the things when I started, I, I started as a DJ, mm. wasn't producing. And when I realized that, hang on a minute, to actually have some kind of longevity in this, I'm going to have to produce. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't the most natural thing in the world for me. Mm-hmm. So I realized that I was going to have to be adaptable. There were a lot of people around me in dance music using ghost producers at the time. And I said, no, if it takes me 20 years mm-hmm. to learn to actually produce and to be adaptable and a, a real producer as opposed to using ghost producers mm-hmm. well that's what i'm going to do because for me that's the only on- longevity yeah. and that's the only way i can truly kind of hand on heart put my name over the door of a project mm-hmm. you know and thankfully i've done that and i think it's standing to me now because no, that adaptability that you've pointed out i do believe it is there and i think that's developing and improving over time yeah no, that's awesome. And and sort of aside from sort of your own stuff, what what music have you been listening to kind of most recently? Oh wow, um, I listen to stuff all the time. I mean, I grew up listening to the music that my parents were listening to. So I grew up with Queen, Fleetwood Mac, Dire Straits, nice. Bruce Springsteen, you name it, like it, everything and anything. There was so much stuff. And then, of course, influenced by my friends, I listened to a huge amount of of like kind of nineties hip hop. Mm-hmm. Um, and I listened to obviously bands like Oasis and Blur and the, the whole Britpop thing was a big influence on me just just in terms of the impact it had. Like, I mean, my dream was to be Liam Gallagher or <laughs> Fred Murray, our lead singer in, in a stadium rock band like Def <laughs> Leppard, a lot of the old stuff. Again, my parents influence. Um, so for me, that was the first thing. But then I realized, hang on a minute, you can create your own sounds. Yeah, yeah. With DJing and with sampling and with electronic music. So I would have listened to a lot of, um, I mean, Again, so, some of the older school DJ wise like Sasha and Digweed, when I was very, very oh, yeah. young, I was copying my friends, like my friends CDs and things. And they, there was one friend in particular who had a lot of Sasha, Digweed, Carl Cox, nice. uh, that kind of stuff. So again, I was listening to that. But more recently, I quite literally listen to anything that's in the charts, whether I like it or not. Mm. I listen to anything that's in the charts because I'm influenced by it. There's always something yeah, yeah, from yeah. a production point of view or a creative point of view that I can pull from music yeah. um, 
I listen to I still listen to a lot of older hip hop. I'm not as big a fan of I like a lot of grime in UK hip hop now. The American stuff doesn't necessarily float my boat the way it used to be. Mm -hmm. There are exceptions to that. People like Rick Ross, who only yesterday I discovered his his Mm -hmm. new album is forthcoming, which I'm very excited about. (laughs) Um, The kind of slower, um, the slower new wave of US hip hop, I'm not as keen on. No. Um, Like the mumble rap and stuff. Yeah, it just doesn't really do it for me. But but the UK sound, most of the UK sounds that currently exist, very much a big big fan of it i mean from the from the big obvious names such as stormy stormzy and skepta and yeah both you know all those kind of names yes but there is such an undercurrent of mm. that that sound coming from the uk and from ireland now as well because yeah, yeah. pop is absolutely taking over here mm. in ireland as a subculture and it's oh, about really? to explode i think into the mainstream oh, okay. and there, there are so many different sounds coming from here that i think are going to be really really big so That's listen cool. to a huge amount of that and every kind of dance music that I can lay my hands on, which is always okay. <laughs> so everything from, I mean, industrial techno to <laughs> down tempo and chilled ambient stuff. I, I genuinely do yeah, listen to love a bit of everything right across the board. And That's there's great. very little that I don't like from it. You know, I mean, there yeah, are varying yeah. degrees of what I like, but I like all genres. Yeah, it's it's just I just like music and yeah, good music yeah. is good music. Irrespective and it's, of as you say, it's good to get inspiration and, you know, from different different areas. So, yeah, no, it's always, always good. Um, yeah, t- if you had to remix like a, a chart song um, now, what would what would it be? Uh, great question. Um, I think probably my favourite chart song of of I mean that that's still contemporary is the Marshmallow Churches collab. Okay, yeah. Um, to which it, there's just something. I, I the production art is amazing. Number mm. one, but the vocal is next level for me so if i could get my hands on anything that would probably be it um i'd also really like to have an official go at ed sheeran and sean mendes uh collab as well okay um i'm not a huge fan of the song per se i i I mean with all ed sheeran stuff it's really really catchy and Mm. i get the vast majority of it and i get this track without being totally in love with it there are elements to it that I think I could bring a different spin to. And not just, a lot of the stuff that when Ed Sheeran, the remixes come out, a lot of it tends to be quite safe. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it is piano house and would, <laughs> let's face it, would suit my style. Yeah. But I'd love to get really creative with that yeah. and do do some something, something. completely different yeah. and from left field. I'd, I'd really love to get my teeth into, into yeah. that because it's so big, it's so poppy, it's so huge, yeah. ubiquitous and contemporary. I'd love to do something from the underground and maybe do like, I don't know, a Prodigy style remix. <laughs> at, and I think that could be really, really interesting. Yeah, it would, yeah. Or a Pendulum style remix, yeah. you know, <laughs> broken beats and much more pace and just something really aggressive. I think that'd be so cool because yeah. we never hear that with their with their voices. No, know? that's so, true. Yeah, that would, yeah. Do it, do it. Yeah, but I'm going to go for that one rather do than that. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Um, do you? I mean, obviously, you've you've done, you, you do touring and you know gigging and stuff. How, you know, have you when you go out on the road? Are there any cities that you particularly love? Like, you know, get a really good vibe from every time, or? Yeah, there are. Um, Eastern Europe is great. Poland has always been a good kind of stomping ground for me. I love the summer resorts. I'm doing a lot of uh, flying in out at the moment to places like Mallorca, obviously yeah. Ibiza, any any the kind of UK and British. Uh, traditional summer resorts mm. are really good because the crowds are obviously <laughs> they're, they're so enthusiastic i find scotland is amazing okay. glasgow and Edinburgh have both been over the years just the, the crowds never fail there they remind me of a hometown crowd without being at home because oh, irish crowds are very vibrant and vocal you know yeah. sometimes like they're chanting as if it's a sporting event or a soccer <laughs> match or whatever which is just amazing at gigs um I did some really good gigs in the north of, of England in the past year as well. Places like Nottingham and Coventry spring to mind. Okay. Um, awesome. uh, Cardiff was great, as was Swansea. And uh, Brighton and Bristol were both really, really fun for me as well. So in, ter- in terms of the UK, they're kind of my pretty top... Much, pretty much covered it. <laughs> I should mention the Leeds. Like, um, and then I have always in the past found Central and South America a lot of fun. I haven't been in a while and... Australia is mm-hmm. great. There are a huge amount of Irish down in Australia, so you'll always have a few home <laughs> bags flying there. So that kind of enthusiasm rubs off on a crowd as well. So yeah. oh, that's cool. Um, I would say, yeah, the the stand. If I, if you were to if I were to nail my colours to a mast, I would say the best cities for me, if I could pick three, are Dublin, which is always just ridiculous being <laughs> hometown crowd. Um, I mean, I'm not from Dublin, but it's it's big gigs in Dublin feel like a hometown yeah, yeah. crowd. Harlow in Ireland. Um, I would say. 
Glasgow or Edinburgh as a toss-up and possibly Leeds, maybe. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah, cool. so they're, they're the big ones. I love them. <laughs> awesome. And is anything... is BCM and Majorca. That's definitely my favourite club in the world. Either there or, or Lush in Portrush in Northern Ireland. Okay. So. I'll have to look out. I'm actually going to Majorca in a few weeks, so I'll have to have a look. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd highly recommend it. <laughs> um, has anything scary ever happened to you, like when you've been on the road? Um, <laughs> uh, probably the, the scariest thing for me, um, and it's not that scary at all, <laughs> For most people, I would imagine, but there was there was a big Creamfields gig. Speaking of Mallorca, actually in Mallorca last year, mm. and I had my headphones on. The crowd was really responsive, and everything was going extremely well. And I noticed there was a shift in the crowd, mm. and they didn't seem to be quite responding in the way that I expected them to be responding to what mm. was going on in my headphones, which were on at the time. Mm. So I flipped them down and realized. I was after knocking one of the faders down on the mixer and there was no sound. Like, <laughs> now I could hear everything and I was still bopping away. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> nothing. Now, luckily, they seemed to think it was deliberate and started to chant. So I let them milk the moment for a second. <laughs> a, recompose myself and B, kind of let them further believe that this was part it of the show. So I responded to what they were doing and then kicked the music back in. Now I got away with it. But no. I was terrified for for the rest of that set. I'm <laughs> yeah. terrified that I was going to do it again by accident, <laughs> by accident because I'm I'm quite kind of um, exuberant on stage, shall we say? And there's a lot of movement goes on, and <laughs> I was just so terrified I was going to do it again without knowing. Um, apart from that, there was an incident in the US a few years back <laughs> where there was a mess up with accommodation. Okay, and I ended up staying in this this really kind of in the back end of nowhere, just just outside Miami in Hialeah, mm. in a Motel 6, which for anyone who doesn't know is kind of one of these really cheap and not so cheerful uh, chains of motels right, right across the States. And this was a, re- I mean, this was bad. This was in a <laughs> bad area. And not only was I petrified um, being, being dropped off in at number one, but there were gunshots outside oh in the parking lot oh while I was supposedly asleep in bed but was actually huddled up terrified <laughs> and, I mean, uh, me being this 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 green irish yeah, guy yeah. Who was grown up being exposed to no kind of danger <laughs> i was absolutely i mean it's one thing being petrified on stage yeah, and yeah. make a mistake it's another thing thing being actually petrified of gunshots yeah yeah i would never hear or be yeah. exposed so <laughs> that was a horrible night and yeah, nothing happened but I, I mean, that was genuine fear, yeah, you know. That's, so, that's pretty yeah, scary. That was rough. So I was, I was in a, a nicer hotel the next night. <laughs> <laughs> Get on the phone to management quick. <laughs> straight away, straight away, man. That was terrifying. <laughs> Have you got any like pre or post show rituals that you know anything you like do to chill out or anything before or after a show? Um, I always visualize before a show. This is going to sound really esoteric, but um, I always take a couple of minutes to myself for five or ten minutes, and I find a quiet corner and close my eyes and visualize. I'll, I'll always have a look from backstage before mm. I go up and so I can get a clear picture, especially if it's a new venue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so get a picture of what, I, what I'm physically going to be looking at. Mm. And I quite literally sit down and then visualize what that the way that crowd is going to react to me from the vantage point of being behind the decks. Yeah. Quite often visualize different moments such as and um, getting it in the front of the decks if, if they're particularly wild and exuberant mm. and whatever it is might be jumping on the decks it might be jumping into the crowd mm. i'll literally visualize those moments and key points in the set i never plan out a set in advance so I, I never know exactly what i'm going to play but i always know that for example i'll be playing pyt yeah i'll be playing hot step or whatever the big tracks are mm. so i'll visualize those tracks as well and how the crowd respond That's and cool. it's amazing because i find that I mean, maybe it is an imagined thing or, or a form of a universal placebo for me, but it does seem to really work in terms of a focus mm-hmm. and how my set is going to flow. I find if there are moments when I can't get that moment, when I can't get those 10 minutes to myself or it's not quiet, the set invariably doesn't flow as well as it does. Okay. 
when I do that. So yeah, yeah. again, maybe it is some sort of psychological yeah. or conscious placebo for me, but I, I don't care. Whatever it is, it works for me. Yeah. So apart from that, there isn't really a ritual. Like I, I, I don't party before or after no. gigs. <laughs> um, I'm not a drinker. I don't do drugs. Um, all that side of things doesn't appeal to me. No. I'm very, very focused on the task in hand. And for me, the buzz does come from the interaction yeah, with yeah. the crowd. I genuinely get a high and oh, a sense cool. of euphoria from gigging yeah. that I imagine maybe other people get from from different sources be it yeah. drink drugs whatever that might be you yeah. know d- d- different kind of um, a different kind of high yeah. and I found in the early days of doing especially big gigs that I used to get a downer then as well the next yeah. day or, the, or maybe the Monday after a, sat- a big Saturday gig yeah. and I had to learn to cope with that psychologically as well yeah. because I used to I'd be kind of sitting, not able to focus on anything. Yeah, just bummed. I wouldn't be able to do work in the studio or whatever it was. And I'd be, for all intents and purposes, scagged out <laughs> after, after doing the cleanest gig, you know. And it was yeah. that mental high yeah, yeah. and low that came after it. So I've, I've learned to deal with that and manage that. And that's not yeah. a problem for me anymore. But I suppose music, it's a cliche, but music is kind of my drug. And I've always been driven by that. Mm. I've never been driven by fame. I've never been driven by financial success or anything no. like that i mean there were far easier paths i probably yeah. could if that because it, it, it's it's hard work a lot yeah. of hard work but it's work that i love and i'm genuinely passionate about and i'm happy doing and that that is why i do it and yeah, it's that cool. connection with um people and crowds and when somebody comes and they sing a song back or they say i, I really like that song that you did mm. that's my fuel it yeah, really yeah, is definitely. and all the money in the world would never replace that and oh, hopefully cool. i'll have all the money in the world yeah. <laughs> That it, it will never be the driving force for me. And I think the day that that starts to overtake my love for what it is I do, mm-hmm. that's the day I need to do something else because yeah. I want to do what I love yeah, at all times sense. in so much as I can. And luckily, I have a job that allows me to do that at the moment. <laughs> yeah, very cool. <laughs> um, I promise not to keep you too much longer, but uh, what other passions do you have outside of music? Um, sporting way, I've, I was always big into sports growing up. Tennis was my number one. Um, tennis and football, soccer as we call it in Ireland because we have Gaelic football here as well. Um, so I'm, I'm still very active physically. Um, I try to hit the gym as often as I can. More more for my headspace than anything physical. Yeah. I find it's, it's a really good way to just detach after a busy day in the studio or whatever mm. and switch off from the world, even if it's just for an hour. And, and physically doing something gets the endorphins flowing and it always puts me in a good form, even if I've been in bad form before. Mm. Um, Again, music was my big, big passion and hobby growing up. Mm. So the fact that it is my job means that there, there's a huge crossover. So it's yeah, very yeah. boring to say, oh, well, I love listening to music, you know. Yeah. <laughs> what I do. I love listening um, to music. <laughs> Travelling is another thing. And again, it's another thing that my job feeds into. Um, I don't think it's by accident that I've ended up doing this job mm. um, because I wouldn't be able to see the world to the extent that I do without doing a job of this nature. I mean, mm. I'm very, very lucky to have visited all kinds of different countries and continents that I probably never would have got to see otherwise. And mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm very into kind of a lot of, like, I'm quite a spiritual person as well. And without, yeah. without getting too airy-fairy about this, um, I'm not religious in any sense of the conventional mm-hmm. use of the term. Um, but I do believe in energetic powers and the universe. And I believe that we're all part of something connected. And I think that extends to nature. So... What I like to do in spare time as well is, for example, I grow my own food. Oh, nice. uh, I'm very health conscious and I think that the environment that we, we live in and nature, and that, that's all part of us. So mm. I'd be very conscious of being respectful to the environment because I believe it's a part of me. Mm. Um, and that extends to the food that I put in my own body mm. and how I am mentally up here as well. So I, I just think... I think that the, the work I do feeds that and I try to, outside of my job then as well, I try to f- kind of nourish myself in other ways. So mm-hmm. that, that might be food, it might be energetically, it might be spiritually, it might be by surrounding myself with the people around me. And I found that once I'm doing that, other stuff just falls into place. So what do I do outside? I try and educate myself mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. I find that in Ireland, certainly the education system, and I won't get on a rant about this, I find <laughs> that... Um, kids and kids are being schooled rather than educated now, right, um, yeah. with the exception of some of the very elite level educational establishments, you know. And I think a lot of it is, is, is a deliberate conditioning by the powers that be for whatever reason. I won't even get into that um, <laughs> because my theories on it could be completely wrong. But I found that when I left school, I wasn't educated. Mm. Um, I went to went to third level and 
got a degree and that kind of stuff. But music had completely taken over at that part. And I thought, well, if music can bring me on this journey, that whatever length of time I was in school for 15 years or something, our education didn't. Mm. Well, surely I can re-educate myself. So yeah, yeah. I went to the process of unlearning and yeah. I caught on to podcasts very, very quickly and started started listening to so many different viewpoints that you wouldn't get from the normal mainstream yeah, media. Yeah. And that sent me on just just a journey of learning and for me, truth and spirituality that I never would have got from any kind of institutionalized education. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of that in my spare time. So I listen to a lot of amazing podcasts and a lot of amazing speakers and authors. And I read a huge amount. Reading from the day I learned to read mm -hmm. has been possibly my favorite thing to do in the world cool. and above anything else because um reading for me now is is an education so i could read a work of fiction and i i'm learning about different ways to use language yeah, yeah. again languages are, are are another passion of mine and I, I like to learn languages and i always have something on the go hmm. uh, so yeah i, I think cool. learning is a big one for me in the in the unconventional sense yeah, yeah. Uh, uh so that's how I feel. I don't have many hours left in the day, any day. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, if you walk. Again, a very long-winded answer. I'm sorry about that, Matt, but a uh, long-winded <laughs> answer to a short question. But uh, <laughs> cool. yeah, it's pretty expansive. I like to do a lot of different things and try different things. And I'm a great believer in trying anything and seeing if it's for you or for mm. me in the case. And if it isn't, cast it aside. And if it is, well, then go down the rabbit hole. Yeah. You know? <laughs> awesome. Um, what's the best film you've seen lately? Um probably three billboards um okay, yeah i don't know if you've seen that it there's a longer title which i can't think off the top of my head it's like actually it's three billboards outside ebbing missouri or something like that okay. i can't for the life of me remember who was in it maybe casey affleck or someone it was a big film anyway about mm. two years ago but i only saw it recently and it i enjoyed that and it hit me in a way that a like that that a big hollywood blockbuster hasn't in a long long time because okay. i've I find that like I'm I'm not big into the superhero thing or yeah. a lot of the blockbuster stuff doesn't do it for me. Um, I don't watch much TV at all. Every now and again, I I, I might kind of dip into a series, but mm. I don't watch television kind of as a rule. I decided years ago to consciously I threw out the television about ten years ago <laughs> when I was getting serious about music production. Yeah because I wanted to just immerse myself and learn yeah. as much as I could in that, and I never really got back into it in a big way. Mm. So I'm probably a bad person to ask in terms of that. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Mm. Uh, but I, there's a lot, a lot of really good uh, Scandinavian uh, stuff out there at the moment. There's a TV series that I watched relatively recently uh, called Brun Bron the Bridge. It translates as, and there is, there is a UK version of it as well, a UK French version of it. Uh, but it's the Swedish Danish. It's about, um, it's about two police forces or detectives on either side of the bridge that links Denmark and Sweden. And there's a, there's a killing that takes place, a murder on the bridge. Oh, okay. So there's kind of, um, there's a cross jurisdictional issue there. So they work together on it oh. and it blew my mind. It was amazing. And it kind of got me into that whole Scand Scandi noir genre of, um, of Scandinavian TV. And mm. I've watched a lot of series, none of which I can remember the name. Cause it's <laughs> but for anybody who's maybe, looking for something on Netflix yeah. um, who's kind of watched all the usual suspects some of those Scandinavian series okay. if you can deal with subtitles which I don't mind at all yeah, are apps there's some amazing ones there The Killing is another really good one. Oh yeah I've heard that's really good yeah so I, I, I enjoyed that I watched the US one as well didn't like it as much but the the original Scandinavian one was great yeah. I thought okay awesome and and lastly really what's what's the best advice you've ever been given um couple of bits of good advice one which seems like an obvious one is to be yourself, but mm -hmm. I, it's advice that I didn't heed mm. uh, for a long time. And I was always kind of looking up to people and trying to emulate what other, what others were doing. And I found the minute I actually started to let my own creativity flourish and my own, ju just in life, even mm. just aside, aside from music, the minute I became more comfortable in my own skin and quite literally stopped worrying about what others were thinking about me. Mm. That's when I started to really enjoy life in mm. general. And that extended then to work and to relationships and everything else. So that, that was a big one. Mm. And another one was, and again, it just seems really obvious, but it's like treat people how you would like to be treated yourself. I find that the more that I do that, the better I'm treated by other people. Yeah. And the less kind of mishaps I have both professionally and on a personal level. Mm -hmm. And 
I, and again, that feeds into making your own look. I, I think that's how we make our own look. We put ourselves in a position, be it spiritually or be it in terms of work ethic or whatever it might be. Mm. Um, I think if, if, if we tr are treating the people around us with respect and professionalism um, and a level of decorum that we would expect ourselves, well, I think we will reap that. Maybe it's karma, but we'll reap mm. that tenfold in my experience. And I think if we treat people like shit as well, or maybe I can't say that, but if, if we treat <laughs> badly as well, well, I think that will come back in spades also. I think the universe always finds a way and it just does. It doesn't necessarily care about whether we are being good, bad. Yeah, um, no, I agree. That, that, that duality doesn't necessarily exist. It just does. Mm. And for every cause, there is an effect. Mm -hmm. And what we put out in the world, we will get back. Yeah. And I just believe that th there's no harm in being nice. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I how, how hard is it to be yeah. nice? Yeah, yeah. It's actually you harder to go out of your way and be horrible than it is to be honest with people. Yeah. Um, but but I, I think you can be honest in a nice way and mm. uh, that that's the best advice I could give anyone like try and forge your own path be mm. yourself it's great to have inspirations and to have heroes but do not live vicariously through them <laughs> through them I mean I mentioned Calvin Harris earlier mm. he's an inspiration for me but I don't want to be Calvin yeah, Harris yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I want to be me yeah and, I mean I want to be the best me that I can be yeah, and yeah. that's all I can do with the time I'm given in this <laughs> world and that's all I want to do so again it's it's keep that perspective keep that frame mm. so be the best that you can be not the best that you think somebody else expects you to be yeah, yeah. And I think if we kind of have that in there all the time, not just in here, but in there too, I think we're on a, a very good path for ourselves. And that path might lead us somewhere completely unexpected. <laughs> I didn't expect to be doing this for my job. I often hoped it would be, yeah. but I didn't expect it. Yeah. And um, I, I'm just really, really grateful that it is. You know, that's the last piece of advice for me is sometimes just pause, mm -hmm. be aware of what you have in your life, no matter how bad things seem at times, there's always something positive and be grateful for that. If you can every day find something to be grateful for, yeah. I think, well, again, good stuff is going to happen to you. Yeah. And that that's my experience of life. And I, I, I don't always succeed, but I, that's what the way, the code I try to live by, you know. Oh, that's cool. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for, for taking the time to chat. It's, it's been a real pleasure. And no, uh, the pleasure. Yeah, good so, luck with... Thanks, thanks for your time, Matt. Yeah. I appreciate it. No worries. Well, I, yeah, good luck <laughs> with, uh, with the upcoming releases. Great stuff. Thank and I hope to see you soon. Thanks a million. <laughs> It come near the hip hop, turn up, on the lyrical gangster, turn up, pick up the cool in the area, turn up.